Thank you very much, Marina, for your kind introduction. I would like to take um, as my point of departure the four claims or theses or tenets I presented you with on the first day of this event, the summit. Um, and we all take now as the agenda for sustainable development and environmental protection and responsible conduct in the biosphere, the, social, the, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And when you analyze these, you soon find out that um, essentially all of them, maybe most of them, are connected to social dilemmas um, which result when selfish actors jeopardize common goods, according to the paradigm of the tragedy of the commons. And in order to mitigate um, such situations, we need quantitative models because essentially our linearly thinking and intuition geared brains are not quite suitable for understanding all the complexities and all the feedbacks that are involved in the complex systems we have to manage. And in devising these models, we have big challenges because while stylized models are already working well, um, we need to incorporate behavioral, social, and institutional dynamics into these models, and we need to do that with realism that enables predictability. And as I said on the first day of the summit, this requires a further unification of the behavioral science across all these disciplines and fields listed here. So in particular, I will mention again in a few slides um, evolution, economics, and cognitive science. And with that, I switch to the second part of my introduction, which is about system thinking. You saw the term systems perspectives in the title of my talk. So what is system thinking? I think we all have a notion and some intuition what it means, so let me just run over a few basics so that we are all on the same page. The main um, picture that you need to um, appreciate in a systems context are connected subsystems in interactions and errors and boundaries. So I've uh, put this into this little table for illustration. Um, we can look at all the levels of our uh, sustainability challenges from the very global level of the biosphere to the national level of um, federal decision taking to regional levels, communities, and all the way down to individual levels like households. Um, the actors differ, the agency differs. We have supranational in institutions, then we have governments, NGOs, country officials. Um, we have regional private entities, but also regional public entities, and then, as mentioned, households, firms, and banks. And often they interact in complex ways, horizontally within one level and vertically across levels. So this system of systems framing is often really helpful to make sure that essential parts of the analysis are not left out. And further on, to, ex uh, to um, gear our minds in the right way, we want to be inclusive in this analysis. And here's a kind of um, mental laundry list you can use when you are faced with a complex problem. And just quickly go over these uh, different dimensions and make sure you cover as much as possible, as much as needed, from them. So this takes us from the impacts. Usually there's not just one impact, for example, on uh, the um, biodiversity protection, but also related impacts on, say, uh, food provisioning. And then feedbacks are central. rise from the microscopic interactions in complex systems and often have a surprising character. So we must take them into account as much as possible in our foresight. And then all of these systems have stakeholders. There's not just one convenient social planner that needs to be satisfied, but different stakeholders with different values, with different beliefs and different interests that we need to take into account. And then carrying on, we can further maybe broaden the horizon as needed. We have to think about sectors. We might think of the energy sector, but it's related to the water provision. It's related to agriculture. So going over that kind of nexus is really helpful to establish a good systems perspectives. Then uh, governments, governance dimensions, you might have to deal with a local authority, but then there are regulations from a national authority to keep in mind, so that is also useful. Disciplinary and interdisciplinary perspectives have to be 
combined, no surprise there. And ultimately, you want to transcend a single scale and connect the systems analysis across multiple scales in the vertical direction I showed before. Furthermore, systems analysis is open and methodologically open and pluralistic. So it's useful to think in qualitative terms, but that usually needs to be combined with quantitative methods. It's also useful to think in terms of stylized models, which often bring out certain phenomena very clearly, but often ultimately then for prediction and management, we need complex models. And all of this has to be brought together in a coherent framework, which is often based on narratives and case studies. Now, the systems perspective, of course, is not new. It has been recognized in all the disciplines in different ways under different terms. And um, <clears throat> I start here with one of the earliest um, in this regard, the scissor metaphor of Herbert Simon, who is also the father of the bounded rationality concept. And he cogently observed that if we want to understand human cognition and human behavior, it's always in the context of environmental conditions and constraints that we operate, that our mind is formed, that our decisions are taking. So behavior is the um, juncture of the cognition with the environment, and neither blade of the scissor can cut alone. They have to be considered together. A little bit later, um, the field of cognitive science recognized the importance of embodied intelligence. How, in, how intelligent, um, how capable can an artificial intelligence be that is just trained without having a body, without having interactions with the environment, without the ability to probe and experience? So feedback interactions with the environment are recognized as central for building an intelligence. And when you look at these encoder, decoder models or general language models, there's a real debate how far they can go without having such embodiment. In the context of evolutionary theory, there's a framework of adaptive dynamics which comes forward with a similar clear pronouncement that we need to consider resident biological agents in ecology as modifying their environment. The term here is niche construction of frequency dependence. And then this environment is experienced by variants, genetic variants, sometimes phenotypic variants. And if they are successful in the environment set by the residents, then they can invade and sometimes replace the residents. This is what we call eco-evolutionary feedback. So all of these are examples about the interaction between um, subsystems in the context of a broader environment. And with this, I would like to move to the main part of my talk. Um, I've selected uh, five vignettes that illustrate, from my personal perspective, the current research challenges for building realistic models of human cooperation. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. I think there are quite a few more challenges, but um, just to give you an impression, I think these are some of the most important ones. Let me start from the idea that strategies, decisions we take, are usually in a continuous context. They are graded. You have to decide how much time you, you invest in a task. You have to decide how much money you give to a certain entity. Uh, you have to decide uh, how far you go to maybe buy a product. So it's not on and off decisions. It's not binary. And unfortunately, almost all of classical game theory that um, is still very, a very active field today is built on stylized strategies that are binary. So famously, you have cooperators and defectors. And that gains a lot of knowledge and um, important knowledge, but um, there is more to human interactions than binary strategies. And that also takes us to the field of social norms, which are usually graded. Then there are so many mechanisms that can promote cooperation. It's actually an embarrassment of riches. You can change the structure of a population, the assortment of interactions. You can uh, put regulations on the agents. You can give positive incentives. You can give negative incentives. You can allow agents to have a voluntary contribution or a mandatory contribution. And over the last 10, 20 years, these um, aspects have been investigated, 
um, more and more comes to the fore, but there is still a big gap in bringing them all together in realistic models that are not just focusing on one mechanism, but on the entanglement of these me mechanisms in realistic social dynamics. Then there is multi-level selection uh, that takes us back to the system perspective and the vertical dimension. Um, we have agents that are reporting or regulated by agencies, and these agencies or institutions are often there to ensure a cooperative functioning of the system. But um, in such a context, you also have to wonder how does the institution keep functioning? Who is guarding the guardians? Who is making sure that the institutions are doing what they should do? Then we come to the big field of bounded rationality. Bounded rationality is a polite term for uh, various degrees of irrationality. We saw quite a lot of that in the context of the COVID-19 crisis and the public response to that. So certainly, certainly we are by no means uh, optimizing agents that have some sort of utility functions coded into our minds and um, act according to this paradigm of the homo economicus or the rational actor model. And then there's plural rationality. I said we don't have a single social planner usually. We have multiple stakeholders and addressing this stakeholder diversity is imperative for cooperation models that um, have any bearing on reality. So I now um, walk you through these uh, five um, particulars and uh, start with continuous strategies and evolving social norms. So what is a social norm? A social norm often translates an observed uh, feature in your environment to action, to a decision. And uh, in the context of cooperation models, the two main features that are to be considered and which I link here in this picture is the level of cooperation that you observe in other agents. How much do they give to the common good? How much, for example, do they help in cleaning the dishes from a communal kitchen or how much do they help with um, mitigating climate change by reducing emissions? And then you have an incentive on the vertical axis, which can be positive in form of rewarding or negative in the form of punishment. Here, the illustration is on punishment. Now you need to link the two. So at a given level of cooperation or um, acting according to expectations and rules, um, what is your institutional, what, what, is your, what is your sanctioning response? And um, when you link this in, by the sigmoid curve, you can see in this slide, then you realize this is actually an emergent definition of defectors and cooperators. So the defectors are those, by definition of this curve, that are giving too little and therefore are sanctioned, and the cooperators are those who give enough and therefore are free from this negative incentive. So that takes us very quickly to the perspective of letting this social norm evolve. And um, in practical terms, you can do that by four scalar quantities. We have the cooperation level, that's the primary trait. You want to bring that up. And then we have three traits or features or strategy components which determine the inflection point of this sigmoid curve. So where do you cease to punish? The severity of the punishment, that is the maximum of the curve, and the strictness of the punishment, which is the steepness of the curve at the inflection point. Now we can put that into an individual-based or agent-based model, crank the handle with a public goods game as the basis, and see what happens. And it's quite remarkable. You can start from a society of agents that do not cooperate and do not punish. That is a completely ancestral um, social void, if you will. Um, one could imagine a tribal society maybe starting out from such a setting. And then there's bootstrapping. Bootstrapping means that starting from zero, you get going with cooperation through punishment. And actually, many models of cooperation cannot do that. So it's quite a feature because in many models of cooperation, you need to exceed a certain threshold of cooperativeness before cooperativeness takes on further. So here you can start from literally zero and gear it all up to a rise of cooperation through the threat of punishment, which keeps pushing cooperators up. And that's also very interesting. It means that the evolution of the social norm implies that early in the game, a certain investment may be enough. And you are qualified as a cooperator who doesn't get punished. But late in the game, expectations have risen. The 
group has moved on to higher standards of cooperativeness and you need to invest more in order not to get punished. Um, this is actually related to the idea of keeping certain envir international environmental agreements dynamic and making the expectations contingent on the level of compliance. I think there is a lot of potential in this idea. The second example is about um, the interaction between different mechanisms and harnessing their synergies. So here you have um, three fundamental incentive policies that one could consider when you are confronted with um, a cooperative challenge. And for the sake of completeness, maybe let's consider a classroom which is very unruly and you want to bring it to order. And uh, you could start by rewarding individual uh, students, all of them are kind of shouting and running and you start to reward individual students who are behaving well. Um, that is good for getting the cooperation off the ground. So this jump starting of cooperation through rewarding works very well. But then to keep cooperation rising up and eventually to keep it going to 100% through rewarding is very difficult. You keep rewarding everybody, it kind of loses its differential um, ability and um, it's also very costly. Now, you could think about punishing. So punishing is very good when we are close to full cooperation. You just pick out the few unruly agents and um, invest your institutional budget or your patience in, um, in um, negative incentives and you bring them back to order. Works very well. But if you start from an uncooperative state of the system, this is not working at all. There's a threshold like the one I mentioned before of cooperativeness you need to exceed before punishment takes you in the right direction. Otherwise, it actually takes you in the wrong direction. So now it's quite an obvious idea, but <clears throat> a few years ago when we did it, uh, it was the first time it was done to combine these two and to try to harness the advantages of um, the one without losing the advantage of the other. I'm trying to go back because it went forward without my doing, ah, there we go back. So this is what we call, to kind of catch a, to coin a catchy phrase, first carrot, then stick. You know the carrot and stick approach. It's a bit more specific than that. It's first carrot, then stick. So you start with rewarding, and you then at a certain point switch to punishing. And you see in this diagram here, it has um, terrific properties when you do that. You can start, you can jumpstart cooperation so you get the cooperation off the ground easily with rewarding. At a certain point, you switch to punishing and you bring it to completion. And when you look at the horizontal axis, the incentive strength, you need far less money or resources or patience to do that with this hybrid strategy than with the rewarding strategy and um, certainly than with the punishing strategy. So that seems like a good idea and it's actually not so frequently used in practice. Um, in institutional practice. Uh, we can corroborate that this is a very good idea by looking at the effectiveness and efficiency. Effectiveness means under how many different situations does it work. These are spread out in this square here and if we can bring the frequency of cooperators which is used as an indicator on the left hand side high up to green that's good. So we want to have a large green area and you see the green area is largest for the first carrot then stick approach. And then we also want to be efficient so the cumulative cost of the enterprise should not be too high. Again, green is good, and you see the first carrot then stick is far better than either rewarding alone or punishing alone. We can also put this into a spatial context. Um, <clears throat> in reality, we would probably have to think about social networks rather than grids, but the principles are the same. If you have rewarding alone, then you get these clusters, these diluted clusters of cooperators that eventually cover the whole system but never go to full cooperation. Punishing alone produces compact clusters of cooperators which do go to 100% cooperation but only work with high incentives. And when you combine the two, you switch from rewarding first to punishing later, then you get the best of both worlds. You get first these diluted clusters which create the conditions for the compact clusters of cooperators to emerge in a kind of booster stage of the process. I now come to the third example <clears throat> about multi-level selection and what we can do to keep institutions functioning. This is research in its infancy. It's um, a model we published in PNAS uh, just um, a couple of years ago. 
which was motivated by recognizing that much of evolutionary game theory assumes that these incentives I have now been talking about, once established, get implemented correctly, or only with random errors. So you have incentives, they help cooperation, but how about the reliability of the incentives? Maybe something goes wrong with the incentivizing agents or the incentivizing institution. So in real life, incentives provided by institutions are subject to the risk of corruption, unfortunately. A lot of de developmental aid um, is not as efficient as it could because of such issues. Um, that potentially jeopardizes the pro-social effects of these incentives for obvious reasons. So what influences the dynamics of institutional corruption? Can it be avoided? And if so, how? Very big questions which we cannot answer, but we built a first game theoretical model of the problem. Again, one would wonder, such a big problem, obvious relevance, but nobody had done it before, so we did this little bit of pioneering work, and it's very simple and stylized, but it does give insights. <clears throat> so we have um, different types of cooperators and defectors, which are either uh, looking at the reputation of the umpires, which is the institution, or not. So being cognizant of how honest or corrupt the umpires or the institution are is a key mechanism in this model, and we assume that agents can invest a certain amount of money to find out about this um, state of the institution. So if they pay this money, they can learn that the umpire might not be honest, and therefore maybe they don't engage the service of the umpire to mitigate their cooperative gains. That's the basic um, system here. And you see these tetrahedra, these are the simplices uh, for four discrete strategies. So unfortunately here we are back to discrete strategies. And uh, in each tetrahedron you have either honest umpires, fully honest umpires, or fully corrupt umpires, left and right. And th these are connected by horizontal lines which describe the frequency of corrupt umpires going from left to right. So then you can see that under certain conditions you have damped oscillations to a fixed point with actually rather high levels of corruption, or you can have cycles, limit cycles, in this um, simplex of the game that um, go through um, pr the prudent operate, uh, cooperators, which are scrutinizing the integrity of the institution. First to optimistic cooperators, which are foregoing this scrutiny in order to save money, because they think it works anyway. Yeah? So in a system where corruption is low, investing into the scrutiny is not necessary. But that's uh, the road to doom, because once you have the loss of the scrutiny, corruption shoots up, that's the upper part of the orange curve, uh, that brings back the, the prudency, the, the scrutiny of the institution, and that brings then back the honesty of the institution. So we see that, I think, in many um, real-life context, maybe not as extreme as in this stylized model, but when things are going well, it's always hard for politicians to argue to keep investing into scrutiny. Um, military investments come to mind, uh, which now recently have taken um, direction towards increased scrutiny, increased vigilance for the needs of that becoming more obvious again. I come to the fourth example, <coughs> And that is about bounded rationality. Again, a very big topic, uh, going beyond the homo economicus or rational actor model assumption of much of um, stylized theory. So the example here is based on modeling systemic risk. And you might recall from the global economic crisis of 2008-2009 that systemic risk uh, took a spotlight then when banks defaulted and spread their defaults to other banks to which they were economically connected. That is a paradigm of cascading failures which implies systemic risk. Um, it's very amenable to theoretical studies using network theory and agent-based models. So here we have a little network. In practice, of course, we study much larger networks and we have one failure. And then this failure can spread to another connected agent, let's say a bank that has um, uh, economic ties to the failed bank, and then with a certain probability, in this simple case 50%, this then also fails. 
And then this uh, can spread further across all links, and with a certain probability, failure occurs until eventually the cascade saturates and we have a certain number of failed nodes. Now, this is really important for many practical applications in complex systems because they are highly connected and they are cascading uh, failures that can occur. So how good are we in understanding this? Well, it turns out not so very good, and maybe you're not surprised to hear that. It's not an easy challenge. So we um, assembled a web-based survey in which we showed people such a network. You see it here on the left. And then we asked them certain questions about the networks. We collected more than 2,500 answers and um, analyzed these. So here are the questions we asked. Let's look at one of them. When node X fails, what is the percent probability that node Y fails? Now that's the most basic question of systemic risk analysis. And if you are confronted with seeing this network, it's really not easy to come up with a judgment. You need some intuition, and our intu intuition is not terribly good. The second question is even more pertinent when one random node fails, because you might not have enough knowledge to pinpoint the most likely failure. So if one random node fails, what is the percent probability that you are affected or that random, that, that uh, node X fails? And then there are other questions. So the result of this uh, survey is that, um, in general, systemic risk is quite uh, terribly underestimated very systematically underestimated by about 38%. Uh, we can translate that into a log odds ratio of minus 0.5, roughly. So that's the overall picture. We are all not good, but it's not that we randomly uh, do wrong. We very systematically do wrong in the direction of underestimating risk. And I think this speaks to a lot of economic developments we see. And then if you compare the numbers for the different questions, it's only 0.3 for the simple question, but the 0.7, so something like 80% underestimation for the um, more difficult question when a random node fails. So not, not an easy question. Um, <clears throat> this varies with the type of network we present, high and low connectivity. So with higher connectivity, it's even harder. So by increasing the number of connections by 50%, actually the underestimation shoot up by 400%, so it's quite dramatic. More connections mean that we become, we underestimate even more severely. Um, and then in these questions, uh, when we p name particular nodes, the underestimation is a bit better, so less underestimation, but when we um, ask for random nodes, it becomes even worse. Surprisingly, we even found uh, effects of gender of mood, which we did uh, collect at the beginning, and of age. So all this shows that uh, systemic risk being a very important property is not easily estimated by humans. <clears throat> and with that, I come to the fifth example, plural rationality, addressing stakeholder diversity. So here I take the context of fisheries management, and you know the yield curve. Translate the fishing effort you put in into certain benefits. And the uh, uh, yellow curve is famous, uh, the yield curve. If you do not fish, you have no yield. If you fish too much, you cause the population to crash, and in between, you have a maximum, the Schaeffer, Gordon Schaeffer model of resource management. Then profit peaks to the left of yield because you have costs. Um, employment goes up all the way because more effort requires more work, and ecosystem preservation goes down. So if you look at these four key indicators of utility, then it turns out that fisheries management has traditionally operated on the right-hand side, and now is gradually, gradually, slowly shifting to the left-hand side, where rational um, analysis actually indicates that it should be. So to put this into practice, because this was just a qualitative statement by <clears throat> Ray Hilmon, uh, we built a model that combined the biological, the socioeconomic, and the stakeholder complexity. Um, you, see, you see the biological model feeding into the socio-ecological model. That gives utility components of the four types are indicated. And then we view these utility components from the perspective of different stakeholder groups, construct stakeholder-specific total utilities, and then aggregate those further into what we call joint stakeholder satisfaction. 
in order to um, basis on um, realistic preferences, we extracted from literature and from newspapers estimates of how much different stakeholders care about these utility components and collected them in this matrix. And then cranking the handle, we can plot the joint stakeholder satisfaction as a function of two control variables that managers can tune. The harvest proportion or total allowable catches on the horizontal axis and the minimum size limit, which regulates the gear that you are allowed to use as a fisherman, how large the mesh size must be. You see in color, in green, the good parts of the control space where the joint stakeholder satisfaction is high, and in red, the, black, the bad ones, and in, in gray, the unfeasible or collapsed ones. Uh, the stars or asterisks indicate where we predict uh, the joint stakeholder satisfaction to be highest, and the circles are where the systems are currently operating. So you see quite a gap here. So taking these uh, stakeholder satisfaction uh, quantitative assessments into account should enable us to give better advice and do better resource management. And with that, um, I come to my last slide and the summary. I hope I have illustrated uh, that models of human cooperation can serve as integrative cross-disciplinary devices for exploring solutions to global challenges. A fruitful interface between stylized mathematical models and complex integrative assessment models is gradually developing. And much work remains to be done on understanding and incorporating sufficiently realistic behavioral, social, and institutional dynamics. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>